All right, I'm going to do a video here um, on this subject of Kent Hovind uh, taking a vow of poverty and openly admitting to having an ecumenical agenda to his ministry from the very beginning. And uh, this is a very serious accusation for us to make. And uh, we normally I would build up to the hardcore evidence, but now we're actually going to do it in reverse. I'm going to give you the hard evidence first, and then we're going to give you the supporting evidence to prove what we're saying. We have here a copy of the affidavit of Dr. Kent Hovind. He wrote it himself, his writing, his notes on the thing. We will be putting screenshots up of it as we go through this. And we are reading from the, the printed copy here. We have screenshots and we're also taking video of it and things like that just in case it goes down. But um, we'll start out here. This is September the 15th, 2005. And uh, his handwriting here, what is, go ahead and read that. At the top, he says in his own cursive writing, If it please the court, I will summarize sections to save time, but would like the affidavit and letter referenced to in it. I can't quite make out the last couple letters of that word. Looks like reference to in it to be part of the record. Okay. Now, before we go on. What we're going to be showing you in this document is not just sarcastic, jesting, joking, or whatever else. An affidavit is when you are in court, you are giving an official statement of who you are, what you are part of, whatever else. Okay, this is not the time for joking. This is, you know, this is a court record. All right, very, very, very important thing here. So down here, next it talks about. The Grand Jury Investigation of Creation Science Evangelism, former Faith Baptist Fellowship Dinosaur Adventureland, and Dr. Kent E. Hoven, and he has it written there, I do not own any of these. Underlined, not, and circled the entire phrase. Yes, okay. And we're going to see that that's part of this vow of poverty thing. All right, so go ahead. Let's just go right to the uh, vow of poverty. Uh, okay, okay, know what? Is that the thing there? We we're going to read that. This is the second confirmation that this is a legally binding document okay. that he wanted part of the record. Um, just to be sure that we are serious about him not joking about this legally binding affidavit, the affidavit itself at the bottom of page one says, and I quote verbatim, this affidavit is my affirmed solemn testimony and is offered as evidence for you to consider in your investigation. So again, he's not messing around. He's saying what he's part of. Okay, now go ahead and go to that. We can come back to some of this other stuff then. Okay. All right, this is page four, four of the affidavit, the bottom paragraph on page four. Okay, go ahead and read it. This is verbatim, none of my emphasis. And we're showing you on screen, so. You can read along. In 1989, I took a vow of poverty and to commit all my resources to spreading the word of God and the truth about his hand in creation. That event gave birth to creation science evangelism, both as an expression of my personal calling as a minister and as the name for my church ministry. Our vision for creation science evangelism, CSE, was to organize and operate CSE as an ecumenical, ecumenical. You see it there. And non-denominational outreach ministry to offer education, support, and educational materials to any individual, organization, ministry, congregation, or denomination interested in learning about and sharing the CSE evidence and message. We have always allowed and encouraged others to copy our materials and give them away. Okay, and he has another handwritten note there, which we don't need to read. Okay, now, I know that there's somebody out there, Hoven supporters, and they're going to say, well, yes, you see that uh, the, the vow of poverty thing is just simply a tax... Uh, exemption. Exemption, yeah, which we're going to show you about that here in just a little bit too, who the tax exempt, exemption was written for according to the IRS codes. You'll find this very interesting. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but people will say, well, it's, it's a tax exemption, and that's what he took, this thing of a vow of poverty, what a vow of poverty is, just in real brief, 
We'll get into this more as we continue in the video. A vow of poverty is you are saying everything that comes into the ministry, all the money that comes in is not my property. I will only be given a small salary. Everything coming into the ministry is, is the, the property of the ministry or whoever controls the ministry, which we'll see about that too. And, and it means and, that you cannot have any access or authorization to allocate the funds of your ministry. According to the vow of poverty, you have no control over where the funds go and what they're used for. And essentially, you give up your rights to do what you please with the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, we're going to play here in just a <clears throat> minute or two. We're going to play an actual audio clip of Ken Hoven talking about him taking himself taking a vow of poverty. And he calls he compares himself to a Catholic priest. I'll play that here in just a minute. But the question is brought up, well, if you have taken a vow of poverty and all the money that you make goes to the ministry, do you leave an inheritance for your children? And the answer to that is no. You see, the vow of pro poverty is usually taken by Catholic priests who don't have children. And all of the money that they make goes to the church, the Vatican. Although there is one little exception to that according to an article that the Lord gave well, us. Well, we can get into that in a little bit. But let me just get into this thing of a vow of poverty here real quickly because they bring up in this audio thing that we're going to be listening to, they bring up a verse in Proverbs. And that's fine, but there's an even stronger verse in Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. It says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Inheritance is required. According to the Pauline epistles, you don't have to go back to Proverbs, back to the Old Testament. Pauline epistles, instructions for a Christian today, you're supposed to lay up for your children as a parent. So Ken Hoven, even if he was completely innocent, even if there's no Catholic tie-in, which there is, even if there's nothing there, he still is in sin for not laying up for his children. Totally in sin. There's no justification for his thing there. But if you want to say, oh, but, you know, but he was just doing something. It's a tax exemption. It's a tax exemption. Okay, then, smarty pants. What about the ecumenical thing? Why would a man who claims to be a King James Bible-believing independent fundamental Baptist, which there's issues there, but why would he say that the goal of his mission, what's the exact wording? The an opera was to organize and operate CSE as an ecumenical and non-denominational non outreach ministry. Okay, why? Explain that to me. Ecumenical. If you are brand new, saved, and you're going, what does ecumenical mean? Ecumenical means bringing Catholics and non-Catholics together. It is the system of Catholicism is the one that created it. It wasn't created by Bible-believing Christians because, you see, the Catholics have no desire at all to change anything that they believe, except they get worse over time. That's one thing they do change. They're consistent with that. They do get worse over time. But they're not going to give up any of their beliefs or any of their system, but they expect you as a Bible-believing Christian to come and give up your beliefs and go back to Roman Catholicism. Now, if you want to know the true roots of the ecumenical system, it's the Jesuit order, the Counter-Reformation. That was the whole point of the thing. The Catholic Church was losing control in the mid 1600s, 16th century, I was going to say. In, in the mid 16th century, a Spanish Roman Catholic soldier. Nobility. It, yeah. By birth. Ignatius or Ignatius, however you want to say it, de Loyola. Ignatius of Loyola, in other words. He came out and came up with the thing of the Society of Jesus for the express purpose, and you can look this up, this is history, this is not conspiracy theory, the express purpose of the, of the Jesuit order was the counter-reformation. The Reformation, people are leaving Roman Catholicism and saying we need to get away from it, and there's all kinds of problems there. The counter-reformation was to bring those erring people back. Okay, that's the whole point of Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. The whole thing is to draw people back to Catholicism. So when you have somebody say, I am, the whole purpose of my ministry is to be ecumenical, they are saying that they are part of the Jesuit counter-reformation. But it doesn't end there. We're going to get into something here in just a little bit. But listen to this interview. A man named uh, Rudy Davis. Lone YouTube Star, name, 1776. There you go. Thank you. 
reading my Bitte. thoughts. Yeah. This guy, and he's got all kinds of problems himself. The guy's wicked. Okay, he's very, very wicked. He's got some people that he stands up for and defends. He is very, very wicked. Okay, but he interviews Ken Hoven right before Ken Hoven got out of prison. They're on the phone. Ken Hoven's still in jail. All right, and he interviews him and he brings up the vow of poverty. Listen to what Ken Hoven says. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, Pastor Hoven, question number six from uh, Holly's family. My brother Jordan has a question, and this is it. He heard it mentioned on several videos that you took a vow of poverty. Jordan has a two-year-old daughter, my niece named Alyssa, and does a lot of work with Christian charities, but at the same time wants to raise my niece well and in a good home. He wishes to know what made you decide to take a vow of poverty, and how does this reconcile with Proverbs 13.22? which says, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. He goes on to write, He and my sister-in-law want to, to raise Alyssa in a way so that she has an abundant life, but do understand the trappings of materialism. Well, good question. Uh, many uh, people uh, decide everything they have is going to belong to God. So, I have taken a vow of poverty and want to put everything, everything, into God's work, God's ministry. For instance, a Catholic priest will do that. The, ch he then, the church uh, then provides his car, his house, his food, etc., and he doesn't actually get to keep any of it. Uh, you might want to talk to uh, Glenn Stoll, uh, Remedies at Law. Uh, this is a, a more his field of expertise, but you're right, as far as leaving an inheritance, if, if our ministry, uh, everything goes into, into, the, into the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, getting people saved, and my kids are welcome to uh, come in and uh, work there as well, and, and they do. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to do some thinking on that before I give a complete answer, but, yeah, it, it's, it was a tough decision. I said, okay, this, sorry, kids, uh, you can go get your own, you know, and, uh, hmm. Thank you for the question. Let me puzzle on that for a while as far as how does that jive with uh, leaving an inheritance. And I'll, uh, you know, I guess they're just out of luck with my, in my case, aren't they? Especially now since the government came and seized even that. Uh, and we're still working on all that. So that's, that is not over with. and probably won't be over with for about 400 years. This, this injustice needs to be made right. But we'll see what happens at trial. Okay, thank you for the question, Jordan. Can't answer it yet. All right. No question. All right. Thank you, Pastor Hoven. So there you have it. From Ken Hoven's own mouth, he admits to taking the vow of poverty and compares himself to a Catholic priest. All right. You can say whatever you want. He takes a vow of poverty, just like Catholic priests do, so he doesn't leave. So he doesn't have to leave any of his wealth to his children. How about that one? Completely violating scripture. Secondly, he admits that the goal of CSC is ecumenical. <laughs> but there's another one, another real humdinger, as you might want to say. Page five. The end, the last paragraph of page five. Last paragraph of page five. Go ahead and read it. Start from the beginning or start from this point? Just from the point down there. We'll put okay. it up on screen again. I'm quoting verbatim here, so don't accuse me of they're, they're going to see it on screen, yeah. Nothing belonging to CSE is now or can ever become my property. It is the irrevocable and sacred property of an ongoing ministry to the greater glory of God. Hmm, how about that? Uh, what is the Jesuit motto? A M D G. Ad majorem de glorium? I believe so, yes. Latin for the greater glory of God? Yep. Huh. And of course, you know, I'm going to be putting up pictures and stuff here on screen so you can see it yourself. The Jesuit motto is to the greater glory of God. Why would Kent Hoven use the Jesuit motto? And why would he say there, sacred property? Hmm? And by the way, up at the beginning of this page here, page five of his affidavit, he says, congregations all over the country were responding to the message. We had the opportunity to purchase the house we were renting as a parsonage. 
and it became the headquarters of the ministry. By 1996, there were over 10 offices in our parsonage. Since then, we have added onto the structure and have added seven other buildings, so there are now only seven offices in the original parsonage where my family and I have continued to live. Parsonage? Uh, isn't that what Catholic priests call the home that is right beside the Catholic church? They live in their parsonage? And a lot of the uh, Protestants do, too. Gotta love that. Protestants are Catholics, okay? Don't give me this stuff. Oh, the Pro I'm a Protest proud Protestant. I'm not a Catholic. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. At one point in time, maybe the Protestants were separate. I understand that there was some of that. Sure. But Protestants, the whole Protestant Reformation thing was about people that were Catholic protesting abuses of Rome and re wanting to reform the Catholic Church, not abandon it, not get rid of it, not say it's wicked, it's abomination, it's mystery Babylon. Uh-uh. No, we just want to protest and reform it, make it pure. That's, that's what it's about. You say, where, do you, where does that put you two in? Well, we follow the uh, ancient line of Christians there, the Waldensians, the Huguenots. The, there was a lot of Christians like that that were not part of either system, Protestant or Catholic. Okay. The real Bible-believing Christians. Yes. We hold to the scriptures alone. House church Christians of the past. Yes. So, again, here you have Ken Hoven. You go to the last page where he talks about his vow of poverty again. But um, here you have Ken Hoven saying, using Catholic terminology for his home near the church, and he says, I've taken a vow of poverty, like a Catholic priest does, and yet it, it kind of violates some scripture. I, I don't know. I can't really answer that right now. I, I, I don't know. I can't answer it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because you'll blow your cover. But let's read the very last paragraph here, or the last little portion of uh, his affidavit. Go ahead, read it. Okay. Page 10 of the affidavit, uh, the third paragraph down. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought it was the last paragraph, but yeah, okay. Go ahead. We'll read that too, but... Okay. He says, quote, Since I am a minister, have taken a vow of poverty, and as a dependent of the church, he took his vow of poverty as a dependent of the church, and received no monetary income for measurably equivalent value for calculating income tax, and even if I did receive any such income, I would be an exception for such tax liability, and the church is also an exception from, from federal taxes. Why is there an investigation at all unless it is, it is to disrupt the preaching of the creation message? Yeah, whatever. I'm, we're going to get into my theory on this whole thing here in a minute, but read the very, very end of it. Just in case there's still naysayers that are saying, well, he's just talking in jest. He's just, uh, whatever. Oh, and uh, there's another uh, statement similar to this on another page where he says... Okay, but read that last okay. part of the page there. The very bottom of page 10. This affiant, the creator of the affidavit in legalese jargon, acknowledges that the foregoing 10 pages are true, correct, and certain, materially complete, relevant, and not misleading on the ninth day of August in the year of our Lord 2005 in or at Pensacola, Florida before the undersigned witnesses. Okay. So, again, he's not fooling around. He's not making things up. This man took a vow of poverty. His goal and his mission is ecumenical. And for the greater glory of God, he uses the Jesuit motto. Now, I'm going to give you my theory of what really happened with Kent Hoven. I believe Kent Hoven is a Jesuit. I believe he's very highly trained. I know he's very highly trained. Why is it that this guy, his seminars that he did all over the world, it's a rehearsed script all the time? He goes, you look at videos and things. I used to have, you know, VHS tapes. I got rid of them, thankfully. But you can look at the VHS tapes and you can look at the DVDs, the most modern ones that came out. And there's years and years and years between the production of the same videos. And he's saying the same lines, the same way he speaks, the same everything. He's an actor. He's an actor. And yet you watch him today, and I shouldn't say and yet, but you watch him today in his his YouTube channel and he'll answer questions and he says it the same way as he was doing in his seminars. He's trained. Can I make a point? And, and in just a minute, let me finish my, my point here, okay? Um, and the, the whole thing is, 
this guy, now you know what, go ahead and make your point because I know what you're going to say. So you go ahead and make your point, but then I'm going to finish what I was saying, but go ahead. Um, if you've been following this ministry, you know that I come from a Jesuit past. I was born to two Jesuit trained parents. And we have documentation to prove that mm -hmm. if someone graduates or is trained by the Jesuits, they are a Jesuit and affiliated with the Jesuit network. But let me just say this. When the Lord Jesus Christ showed me this documentation on Hovind, I was literally physically getting chills. I was, I was shaking when I read this documentation because the, the buzzwords, so to speak, were jumping off the paper at me each page that I, I looked through with the Lord's help and his guidance. And I, and I literally said, whoa, this reminds me of my childhood upbringing. It was literally, I mean, it, it's like my, it's like Lyle Kutra, who I dub MK Ultra. Um, it's like him speaking with another name in a different uniform, that the exact same sophistry, the exact same briefing, the exact same behavior, the exact same mannerisms, the exact same attitude. Yeah, to explain, let me explain. When she first got saved, we were in correspondence and things, and, uh, and I knew her first as just somebody that was looking to be saved and things like that, whatever, that's a whole part of her testimony, you can listen to that. But I originally sent her a bunch of materials to, so she could study and, and things like that, and I sent her some of Ken Hovind's materials. I was quite deceived by the man. And, um, and she was just like weirded out by the guy, and she's like Within the first minute, I was weirded out and getting right. chills and just shaking because I'm like, I cannot listen to this guy. Something is wrong. And now I realize it was my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ saying, hey, check this out. This guy is a snake. I'll show you why in the future. Yeah. And very recently, and, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has shown us very definitively, beyond a shadow of doubt, that Hovind is part of the Jesuit order. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've seen this thing. And, and uh, you know, getting back to what I was going to say originally, I mean, I wanted to let her say that. I mean, she was raised in a lot of the system. I mean, you can, again, we've talked about this in other videos of just going through her university years and she was invited to Jesuit retreats. She was talked face to face with uh, many uh, Jesuits and things down through the years. She was raised in that whole system. She was military intelligence too, which is Jesuitry. <laughs> so, you know, before she was saved. So uh, she's very familiar with how these people talk and that's why she was weirded out by Kent Hooven. And she told me at first and I was like, huh? You know, and part of the thing that we do when she's researching and I'm researching and things like that, we will purposefully be skeptical of what each other finds as a way to kind of weed out and say, ah, I don't think it's a strong argument and things. And she told me what she found about Kent Hovind, about him taking a vow of poverty. And I was like, okay. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go into this thing skeptical. And I was like, well, you know, I don't know. He maybe just joking. And she's like, it's an affidavit. And I'm like, well, I don't know. And she keeps reading in the document and it goes ecumenical. And she's like, right there, what do you do with that? And I'm going, okay, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, you know, judge me the way that you people out there that defend Ken Hoven, judge me, okay? If I come out and I say, you know what? I'm a preacher of the King James Bible. My video or my, my ministry is King James Video Ministries. We've been around since 2007, uh, 2008. We you know, we're on YouTube, and that's this is the truth. And uh, I founded it originally to be an ecumenical uh, ministry. And I took a vow of poverty. Would you let me go? Would you say, oh, yeah, Brother Brian, he just, you know, well, you know. Don't make excuses for Kent Hovind, all right? He is a slick, polished Jesuit, is what this guy is. I'm convinced of it. I mean, why is he using the Jesuit, you know, code word? I mean, for crying out loud, it's just like, it's right there. And we're going to show you stuff from the Jesuits that this is what they would do. Taking the vow of poverty, doing what Ken Hovind is doing, is what they're doing. But getting back to my theory, I didn't get to finish. I need to get back to this. I believe what happened is Ken Hovind was a trained Jesuit. All right. A lot of the Baptist circles and stuff like that, they're filled with Jesuits. I showed again another guy that we're going to be talking about more as we continue, Jack Hiles. Another man called himself the father. I'm not the chancellor of the university. I'm the father. When Jesus Christ says, call no man on earth father, has a religious title. And yet Jack Hiles says, I'm the father. And he too, by the way, when he died, I'll show you the video clip of this, his daughter, Linda, 
talks about it and she says he didn't leave a cent to any of us. He left it all to the organization. He left us nothing. Here's the video clip. He died a multimillionaire. He left nothing to his children. He left everything to the organization, which my younger sister and her husband now lead. And they still perpetuate his legacy, the strict rules, the undying loyalty, and they still try to keep all the secrets. I never understood why was I the only one of the four kids so tortured by the hypocrisy, so disturbed by the mind control over thousands and thousands of people, and so determined to find a better life? Why was I the only one that insisted on answers to my questions? And why was I the only one that ultimately broke away and cut ties with the brainwashing, the oppression, the fear, the secrets, and the life that had never been my life. So there you go. Another man apparently took the vow of poverty. All right. But here's my theory. Here's what happened. I believe Ken Hoven took the vow of poverty as a faithful Jesuit. But his pride got the better of him. And as he's going around traveling all over the world, getting all these people to worship him, and oh, Dr. Hoven, oh, Dr. Hoven, and all this stuff. Can I have your autograph and everything? All these people just worshiping him and worshiping him and worshiping him. It started to go to his head. And so Ken Hoven looked at his measly little Jesuit salary, and he started to think to himself, you know, I kind of deserve a little bit more of that money. And so he started to kind of take a little bit more, you know, kind of sneak it away. And maybe he was even warned. I have no idea. But eventually uh, he got busted. And that's why he went to jail. You say, well, wait a second. If the Jesuits are in control, they wouldn't have sent one of their own to jail. Oh, they do it all the time. The Roman Catholic Church put Ignatius de Loyola in prison and at one point in time. And tortured him? Yeah. They'll torture their own. All right. So don't tell me that the Catholic Church wouldn't put one of their own people, one of their own agents, in prison and even torture them for a while. They do it all the time. And you say, but, but brother, and, and this is something I've thought about, okay? Brother, what is Ken Hoven doing that's really taking people back to the Vatican? I mean, what's he really doing? Here's the best part. I believe we're getting out before he carries out his mission. I believe the Lord showed my wife this stuff and me as well because I've been doing some of the research along with her on this. Um, I believe the Lord has actually given us this information before this man carries out his mission. Think of it this way. What would happen if creation science evangelism started to promote the new versions? Oh wait, that's right. Eric Hoven, who is now in control of Ken Hoven's former ministry, through GodQuest Ministries, and yeah. they joined together. Did start to use the new versions. They brought in the Jesuit, James White. I mean, the guy's such an obvious Jesuit. I mean, he even tries to make himself look like Ignatius de Loyola. I mean, give me a break, you know? It's just, it's ridiculous. But they bring this guy in. This guy hates the King James Bible. Uh, there's quotes of him saying that he would burn them and stuff like this. And he'd burn Bible believers too when he gets the chance, I'm sure. Um... But this guy comes in, and now all of a sudden Eric Hoven has seen the truth. He's seen the light, and he's no longer King James only. And it's funny, too, because a guy, brother I used to be in ministry with, Brother Jesse Dulesky, confronted Eric Hoven face-to-face -face at a Babel building that he was at, Mount Zion Baptist Church, down in uh, Denver, Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, where I used to be from, um, I'm originally from. And Brother Jesse went up to him and confronted him, and he said, I see that you're starting to use the new King James. Are you going new version? And Eric Hoven was like, oh, no, 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 no. We're, we're strong. We're strong King James. You know, yeah, some of those quotes, you know, there was some that was from the new King James. Oh, no, but we'll always stick by the King James Bible. That's what he told him. That's what he told him. He was lying, just like his dad lies, just like Kent Hoven lies. Now, think about what's going to happen if Kent Hoven comes out and he says, you know, I was wrong. 
I've been using the King James all these years, and you know, and I just, I can't use it anymore. It's filled with errors. And he starts to come out and show errors in the King James Bible. I mean, he's already going against the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. So that's already a little nod of the hat to Rome. But imagine what will happen if he comes out against the King James Bible. I believe the Lord is allowing us to bring this information out to prove that he's a Jesuit. He's an infiltrator, an ecumenical infiltrator according to his own stinking words. I believe the Lord's given us this opportunity to save the faith of some of the people out there that are on the fence and saying, I don't really know what to believe about the King James Bible. I'm, I'm kind of confused on this whole issue and things. And I pray that the Lord destroys this man before he does more damage. All right? But let me just show you another part of the damage. We'll show this and then we'll get back into some of the other stuff. But this is very important to say in this. Because, see, another big thing that the Vatican, one of the key issues for the Vatican, the key issue is to get your faith away from this book. They hate this book. I saw recently David Daniels uh, from Chick Publications, and he was saying about uh, Alberto Rivera, actually said at one point to Jack Chick, he said the Vatican has spent over $2 billion trying to get rid of this book. Think about it. The Nestle's text, how much money did they put into that? How much money have they put into publishing all their new versions that go back to the Vatican manuscripts? There is a certain second, organization at the Vatican that creates all these perversions. Yeah, which we'll be showing proof on that too. How you doing? Okay. All the different new versions that have been printed, all the different church councils, all the different promotional things and everything else. Oh yeah, easily they could have spent two billion bucks. So that's a big issue to the Vatican. Get rid of the King James Bible. They hate this book. They can't stand this book. And I've talked to Catholics okay, former Catholics, and they say, yeah, I remember growing up in Catholic school and it was like, you cannot read the King James Bible. Stay away from the King James Bible. It's, it's heresy and all this other stuff. You'll lose your salvation, you know, you'll, whatever. It's, it's, they hate this book, okay, that's one. There's another one is they can't stand the idea of a rapture. A rapture, you know, as, as many people call it, and I'm just using the term, pre-trib rapture, that thing destroys Roman Catholic doctrine. It eliminates purgatory. I mean, you go right absent from the body, present with the Lord, boom, you're right there. No need for purgatory. You know, it's, you know, their, their system, they teach that, you know, the church, Christ's true church is always going to be on the earth. Uh, not if it gets yanked out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have a whole video on that too. I can't get into all of it, but they hate the rapture. Ken Hoven's going against that. And there's another big one. And that is Revelation chapter 17 identifies a city that sits on seven hills a city that reigns over the kings of the earth. And it's very, very important to the Vatican to change the identity of that city. Why don't you get those pictures up? And uh, it just so happens that a certain man is part of a propaganda film which is yet to be released. And they're having trouble making this film come out. Because you see, the Lord helped me to get ahead of that thing too and bring out my own uh, America is not Babylon moments. Steven Anderson in his latest little propaganda satanic piece for the Vatican, covering up the fact that Mystery Babylon is the Vatican. They try to make it America. And guess who's in it? Let's show you some pictures here. This is his own website, K-E-H, his first, middle, and last name initials. That's what K-E-H stands for. VRLB.com forward slash Babylon. We'll put it on the screen here Right. for you. And uh, this is his own website showing this. Look at the pride there. You know, Babylon USA starring Kent Hovind. Mm -hmm. He's the star. Hmm. So uh, let, me just, let me just give a little shout out here to Steven Anderson. You little faker you. And your little sodomite buddy there from Hollywood, Paul Wittenberger. Let me just give you a little shout out. What do you think about having a Catholic priest? A Catholic Oh, I've taken the vow of poverty and I'm ecumenical in my mission. And he's in your video. You see, the Lord's showing us more and more about you little fakers. And as he shows us more and more, we're going to bring it out. We're warning the body of Christ about you and your system. 
Continue. And oh, Ken Hoven, you know, I remember hearing him. He was like, oh, I flew out there to see Steven Anderson. I don't even remember what it was for. I have that in another one of my videos. I don't remember. I, I just, I can't remember. And here's a screenshot. We'll put it up on screen again here's of uh, some of the behind the scenes stuff for uh, Babylon USA thing. This propaganda piece for the Vatican. Another one. There's Hovind and Anderson sitting there together. Mm -hmm. And Hovind doesn't have any idea about any of this stuff. It's just, I don't know. I don't, I guess, yeah, I think I met him. I think I know who Steven Anderson, yeah, I think I met him one time. Here he is with his family. With Anderson's put it up on, family. Put it up on screen. And here's another one. Sitting at uh, Anderson's kitchen. Eating having, with his family. Yeah, having a meal. Family. Having a meal with, with Anderson. Okay. And then, but he doesn't have a clue. I don't know, not really sure. Ken Hoven is such a stinking liar. It's disgusting. Here's their Facebook page for Babylon USA. Again, you see... Uh, Anderson interviewing uh, G. Edward Griffin. Yep. That, that guy's a new ager. You know, give me a break. And he's a, a secret society guy. Yeah. Of some sort. Yeah, he's... Um, Griffin's got all kinds of issues, but that's another so story. But again, you see Ken Hoven is the big picture there underneath the Facebook thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Notice okay, go to the, the next comments one. of Hoven's picture compared to all the other hmm? snapshots of the other personnel supporting the film and appearing in the film. Um, that's, those are the pictures right there. You've seen all these. Okay, there aren't any, any, any other pictures. What about the picture of the actual DVD? Okay. Do you have that one? I don't know if I put that on. If you don't, it's fine. I can just stick it up on screen here. Just okay. put the picture up there. You can see this is what the thing's going to look like. But, uh, I'm going to make a point here. Okay. Um, think about something. Ken Hoven takes a vow of poverty, and his mission is ecumenical. Okay. Um, what if this man, and he, and he gives the Jesuit motto, that's the, you know, part of the thing too. What if this man is truly a, a agent of the Vatican? Let's just talk about this for a minute. Do you realize that all the money that Christians are giving to Ken Hoven and Creation Science Evangelism since 1989, the thing's been around? All your money went to the Vatican, and he's been lying to you about it the whole time. How about that? How about that? Isn't that something? But uh, let's get into some of this other stuff here, some of these other things on the vow of poverty. We're going to show you some things from Roman Catholic sources, I might add. I think um, it's AMDG, um, Ad Majorium De Gloriam. If I ad majorium de glorium. Because majorium sounds like greater. Yeah. Okay. Ad majorium de glorium. I, you know, again, we'll put up the symbol there of the the Jesuits. So if I missed that's what said they, that earlier, then I apologize. Yeah, that's fine. We're just trying to go by memory here. You know, I mean, we we put together as much information as I can, and it's like you know, we're seeing so many other areas where we could go with this, and it's just like you know what, we need to bring this information out, warn the body of Christ. So, get the uh, thing there about the vow of poverty. Well, or you mean from the sources? The sources, sources, yeah. Okay. The Canon Law. MadeEasy.com. Yeah, CanonLawMadeEasy.com. Okay. An article titled The Priesthood and the Vow of Poverty. Yep, and again, we're going to be showing this on screen, so just read right from there. Okay. Show it on screen. Some Catholics take a vow of poverty even though they are, they, even though they are not and will never be ordained to the priesthood. There are some religious institutes whose members are required to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Occasionally, additional vows particular to their institute are required as well, such as Carmelites, Dominicans, and Jesuits, to name only a few, fall into this category. Okay. They, um, we don't need to read all that right. stuff. But, you know, they, um, uh, well, just this to, is important. Okay, go ahead and read that. They receive a small monthly stipend for personal expenses, you know, and they earn full-time salaries, you know, whether university professors, hospital administrators, yeah. whatnot. But they cannot touch this money as their paychecks are immediately turned over to their religious superiors. Such as the cars they drive, the houses they live in, sometimes even the clothes they wear are not the property of the religious themselves. For these things, as a rule, belong to their religious institute. Sounds okay. a lot like the military. So, let me just stop there for just one minute. Okay, so in other words, what they're saying is, 
a regular priest, a Catholic priest, will take three vows, okay? Poverty, chastity, obedience, those things. They will be celibate, in other words. That's what the chastity thing is there. Of course, it's a big joke because they're, you know, very sexually active many times, usually with, you know, little children. It's part of the satanic ritual abuse that goes into their whole system. Another issue. But then there are special orders of Catholic priests or Catholics in ministry, I should say it that way, and one of which is Jesuits. And we're going to see here in a little bit about their vow that they take. Okay? Continue continue on here. We'll get back to that other thing in a minute. Should I skip over this or read what's highlighted? I basically did the buzzwords of this. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Each institute, religious institute, has its own specific body of law called proper law, which pertains only to its members no matter where in the world they happen to live, like the U.S. military, for an example. Uh, and this proper law must be approved either by the Vatican or by the diocesan bishop in whose territory they reside. Again, similar to the U.S. military. And, you know, you can read this article, you know, you can pause it and read it and stuff like that. We're just kind of skipping through here, getting the main buzzwords. Right. The proper laws governing religious institutes can vary dramatically, either to the historical period or its intended purpose. Uh, you know, Benedictines have existed for well, for well over a thousand years, and Legionnaires of Christ were founded only in the 20th century. Yeah. And whereas Benedictines are generally monastic, uh, closed type of atmosphere, the Legionnaires of Christ are normally involved in active ministry. So, therefore, their systems of gov governance and rules of context conduct are vastly different because the original purpose of each institute, as in intended by its founder, was different. And basically just... <clears throat> Many, but not all, members of religious institutes are also ordained to the priesthood. For example, Sis Sister Sian's Augustinians. Augustinian was the order of Martin Luther way back in the 1500s, or Redemptorists. Um, all these men are both members of their institutes and ordained clergy at the same time. So, kind of a dual purpose there. <clears throat> uh, other members of religious institutes are not clergy. So not all members of religious institutes are clergy. They can also be laity, essentially. For example, all sisters and nuns, like the Sisters of Mercy, the Poor Clares. There are also religious, numerous religious institutes of men who are not priests. For example, the Christian Brothers. And very interesting, too, because, you know, a lot of uh, Baptists can use that term. I'm just, you know, me and my Christian Brothers. And you think to yourself innocently, well, you know, yeah, we're brethren and stuff like that. But you see how they could get in and deceive people and use actual Catholic terms and Catholic organizational names and you would never even know it. It's incredible. And uh, to continue, some institutes which include among their members both ordained priests and men who are not ordained. Um, and some Franciscans are, are unordained brothers and others are priests. So like you could hear of a person being called Father Tom and another of the same Franciscan order being called Brother Tom. So you have both clerics and laity in the same institute, religious institute or organization or order. If these religious are full-fledged members of their institutes, i.e. if they have spent the requisite number of years as aspiring members and eventually made their full profession, their full-fledged members then, and if membership in their institutes requires them to take a vow of poverty, then they ordinarily will have vowed poverty in accordance with their rules. Others, such as societies of apostolic life, whose members are not required to make any vows at all, for example, Paulist fathers, uh, yeah, well, that's that's not real important. Peter, Their point but, is there's some that have not. Right, and these are still priests that have not vowed poverty. Okay. Then the largest category by far is the diocesan clergy. Your average pastor or assistant pastor is not a member of a religious institute, but was ordained specifically for active ministry in a particular diocese. He is under the authority of the diocesan bishop, who usually is the bishop who ordained him, and he does not make vows. He receives a salary, a very low one at that, 
and which permits him to live simply yet with dignity. Yep, that's, while he dedicates that's himself fine. We don't need to read all the rest the of that ecclesiastical stuff. Ministry. You can read all that then. And uh, But go down to this next one. Note that while priests are entitled to some monetary compensation for their ministry, those who have not vowed poverty are not barred from having certain legitimate outside sources of income. A priest may come from a wealthy family, for example, and if he has not made a vow of poverty in a religious institute, he may inherit money and property from his relatives. Okay. Priests who Again. have not vowed pro poverty may also freely choose to invest their income as they see fit, like yep. lawfully owning stocks or mutual fund shares. Okay. So that the point is there's different rules for different orders and things like that. But uh, is there anything else as far as... Uh, um, they're not allowed to have that's well, that's all fine stuff this also ties in with the tax in a way the tax code and priests are not to engage actively in any sort of business outside of the typical efforts to raise revenue for his parish church or school rather okay. it forbids them from having any sort of part-time job on the side like selling real estate or performing but that's, musical performances yeah is there anything else in this article um, the priest cannot engage in hobbies and pastimes of his own desires and accord for the sole purpose of profiting from them. Yeah, the rest of this is all about... Uh, Other than that, it's Yeah, that's... Okay, so we won't read any more of it. Um, the, the whole point is a, a Catholic priest, when you say Catholic priest, most people would think of a diocesan priest. You think of the guy in the Catholic Church that lives in the parsonage right beside it and whatever else and things like that. But there are Catholics... In ministry that have taken a vow of poverty and they don't appear to be priests. I believe that that's what Kent Hovind is. I believe he's a Jesuit. All right. And again, you know, from his own words, he's ecumenical. That's the purpose of the Jesuit order. That's their whole purpose. But uh, here we have Jesuits Midwest. And we're going to show you a little bit of this. Go ahead. Okay. Uh this is from the year 2015, uh, this, this document that I'm reading to you. I quote, The word companions carries a special meaning for Jesuits. When founding our order, St. Ignatius or Ignatius won in his group to be known as the Company of Jesus, synonymous with Society of Jesus. The root of company refers to people who share bread, an ancient symbol of life, mission, and community. And so our company extends beyond Jesuits, and the leaders of Jesuit works to include students and alumni, parishioners and retreatants, um, those who are fed by Ignatian spirituality and who help heal a world, a world in need. Together, let us look to the past with gratitude for all we have accomplished in building the kingdom of God. Okay. And let me just say here, uh, in my previous videos some time ago, I mentioned uh, my former landlord when I lived in Northern Virginia in 2006 when I, during my lost life before the Lord Jesus Christ saved me from my sins. My landlord invited me to a retreat, and at that time I had no idea what that meant. But uh, my landlord's name in its entirety is Arceli Navarro Magpeo, maiden name Magpeo Brown. Her married name is Brown, and that is her full name. And I literally visited, I was a babysitter for uh, one of uh, her family's birthday parties or some kind of a social function. Uh, I've been to her birth home. I've, uh, I talked with her, she told me rather about personal details about her upbringing and such. And uh, she, I forget when, how the events occurred, but one day she just out of the clear blue uh invited me to a retreat and i said what is that oh it's just a singles event where you can mingle with other singles you know and uh funny thing is is she was complaining before this invitation to retreat that uh she you know was on bad terms with her boss because her boss was just so mean but yeah. n nonetheless she is affiliated with the jesuit network because she found out you found out later it was a jesuit retreat yes yeah Okay, so, but here's, here's a very key part of what we just showed you there. Some of you probably didn't pick up on this. It says there that, uh, so our company extends beyond Jesuits and the leaders of Jesuits. Okay, in other words, some guy who's an actual Jesuit priest, SJ behind his name, people say, well, that's a Jesuit. 
but I've got this thing over and over and over again in the comments. Well, my brother-in-law went to a Jesuit university, but he's not a Jesuit. That doesn't make you a Jesuit. Yes, it does, according to them. According to right there, it says that includes students and alumni parishioners and retreatants. Okay? And now at the bottom, I'll put it up here. Brian G. Paulson, S.J., Tom, Thomas A. Lawler, S.J. Their own words. They say, if you've, gone, if you've gone to a Jesuit school, you are a Jesuit. If you're currently attending one, you are a Jesuit. Yeah. If you attend a retreat, you are a Jesuit. Mm -hmm. so, so don't give me this stuff. Oh, it's ridiculous. You, you know, you're not a Jesuit if you just go to the school. Yes, you are, according to them. All right? So, again, that's, that's another little important thing we need to put in there. You know, and so Hovind, Kent Hovind, I mean, can we prove he went to an openly Jesuit school? No, we don't have any proof on that. But why is he taking a vow of poverty like a Jesuit would? Why is his mission ecumenical like a Jesuit's would be? Why is he using the Jesuit motto to the greater glory of God? Weird. And now he's starting to adopt, you know, Jesuit positions. And, you know, his little, uh, what did he build down there? Dinosaur, it's a dinosaur Adventureland. Adventureland. Well, that's a wonderful thing. You could almost go there if you wanted to be on a uh, retreat. Oh, you're stretching things. Of course I'm stretching things. The world is a wonderful place. It's getting better. There is no such thing as the Jesuit order. The Catholic Church is not in control of anything. Believe that stuff. It's really wonderful. Yeah. Sure. But let's continue. It's called sarcasm, people. I know. It's terrible. But uh, let's... This is just... Yeah, you don't need to read right. any more of that stuff. But uh, what else do we have? The um... Um, Then we have this document from the Roman Catholic Diocese of Altoona, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, um, to confirm the other materials and the affidavit. What is the difference between a diocesan priest and a religious priest? A diocesan priest belongs to a body of priests called a presbyteriate who are members of the same diocese and therefore under the leadership of the same bishop. A religious order priest belongs to a specific congregation or community that is bound together by a common mission. Unlike diocesan priests, religious order priests take a vow of poverty hmm. and do not own items individually. Most often religious order priests specialize in a certain type of ministry, such as education, social services, healthcare, or foreign missions. What vows do diocesan priests make? Diocesan priests, priests, priests make no vows. For ordination, they freely make promises of celibacy and obedience to their bishop. And uh, how long does it take to become a diocesan priest? It takes four years after college or eight years after high school, the same as for many professions. How old do you have to be before you enter the seminary? There is no certain age to start preparing for the priesthood. Some people go to high school seminaries, others enter the seminary after high school, after college, or after they've been working for years. And here's key, do priests get paid? Because a priest does not have a family and because he lives a simple life, he does not need a lot of money. In fact, a priest's black cler clerical clothes are an outward sign of the modest standard of li living proper to priestly life and ministry. However, diocesan priests do receive a salary which enables them to buy their necessities, to buy and maintain a car, to take a vacation, and to do normal recreational activities. Also, priests are given free room and board by the parish for which they work, so their expenses are minimal. Uh, again, what vows do religious sisters take? This applies to both genders, as it says. Religious men and women promise poverty, chastity, and obedience. These vows help them to be free of earthly attachments and distractions. They help them to live simply, to be more open to God, and to depend more on Him. Poverty is a sharing of possessions in common with the community. Obedience requires going wherever one is needed and giving oneself completely in service to God's people. And uh, here's interesting thing about the ministry part. What kinds of ministry do sisters do? This also applies to the brothers of religious institutes. The choice of ministry uh, arises from the founding purpose of the community, a prayerful discernment of his or her own gifts, and an assessment within his or her community of the signs of the times. 
according to the needs of the church and society to determine where best to place their energies. Active communities are involved in a myriad of ministries, usually with an emphasis on service, such as education, social work, health care, and parish pastoral work. Yeah. So, again, you see it there from a Roman Catholic website that they're saying, literally, that diocesan priests, the ones that are ordained and things like that, that take the three different vows, uh, they're ones that are you know, ordained to certain spots and stuff, but religious order priests take a vow of poverty. And then they're told to be into certain types of ministry. Okay. Well, do you have the uh, IRS code thing? Yes. Now we'll get into that. Okay. Very interesting document the Lord gave me. And again, we will be showing this on screen for you. Yep. This is called a Form 990 tax return that's filed with the, the regular tax return. It's called the Return of Organization Exempt from Income Tax. That's the title, Form 990. And it is specifically from the College of the Holy Cross out of Worcester, Massachusetts. I learned years ago, that's how they say it, Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> name and address of Principal Officer Philip Burroughs, S.J. At the, at the college address in Worcester, Massachusetts. S.J., Society of Jesus, if you aren't yes. following. Tax exempt status in item I of the top box on this first page is checked 501c3 status. Hmm. Interesting tie into battle buildings, huh? Yeah. Um, Jesuit with 501c3. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of page one, under part two, signature block, paid preparer's use only, prepare signature, uh, Fazal S. Hussein from firm KPMG LLP out of Boston, Massachusetts. KPMG is one of the big four CPA tax and accounting firms of this country. So uh, interesting that uh, the big four would work with the Jesuits in tax preparation, but I'm not surprised. Uh, then we have on page... I think it's 36 or 37 if you actually look at the file, but... No, we're going to be schedule, putting it up on, on screen again. Right. Schedule J, Form 990 Schedule no, J. To point towards compensation, the thing. It's up on screen. compensation information, College of the Holy Cross, um, is the section we're looking at. And Part 2, Officers, Directors, Trustees, Key Employees, and Highest Compensated Employees. You can look at that list of names, but here's the really big kicker of this document. Part 3, Supplemental Information of Schedule J, Form 990. Uh, return Reference 1A. Certain officers, key employers, employees, or highly compensated employees are authorized as part of their compensation agreement to obtain a membership in a social or recreational club. Uh, these dues are grossed up and included in the reportable compensation. Um, it goes in to explain different parts of how Jesuits working at the Jesuit college are paid um, to include non-qualified retirement plan and amounts included in deferred compensation as they accrued. Um, the executive committee is, is a part of the board of trustees that approves compensation of the college. Um, these retired Jesuit officers one by the name of William Durgan had an early retirement payout of $612,000 before employee benefits deduction. Rather steep there. Uh, Robert Grenon, controller, retired with an early retirement payout of $355,000, including non-taxable benefits. <laughs> Crime does pay. Mm -hmm. When you work for the Vatican, sure. Uh, David Humman, professor, uh, he had an early retirement payout of $175,217, including non-taxable benefits. Uh, under the Faculty Early Retirement Policy, described for Schedule J, Part 1, Line 7, you can look that up yourself, Michael Perry and Sean Carney separated from the college. Uh, 
Perry, separated with $265,000 per his employment contract, which included provisions for separation from the college. Or, I'm sorry, that was Carney. And Perry was paid $110,618 as severance. This is very critical, this next note yeah. here. Pay attention to this one. I quote, Members of the Society of Jesus, SJ acronym, take a vow of poverty. Compensation is paid directly to their order, which is exempt under Section 501c3. Under uh, Revision Rule 77 TAC 290, members of a religious order providing services to a Catholic organization will be considered for tax purposes to be an agent of his order, provided the religious order is subject to a vow of poverty. The religious order is providing services for a Catholic organization listed in the official Catholic directory at the direction of his superior, and the full amount of compensation is remitted to his order, which is exempt from tax. The college has established a voluntary early retirement program for tenured faculty members who have completed 15 years of service and attained age 62, who are entitled to a percentage payout that decreases over time and are able to remain enrolled in the college's available medical health plans. Okay. Did you get that? Did you understand? Okay. Let me just, let me just hold on to that for a minute there. Members of the Society of Jesus take a vow of poverty. What did Ken Hoven say he took? And I, I just can't really explain it right now. I, I can't really talk about it right now. I, I, I just... I, uh, he took a vow of poverty so that he could have a ministry that's ecumenical. Ecumenical is Roman Catholicism. They are the ones that came up with the ecumenical movement. He is admitting to his Catholic masters, to being under his Catholic masters, I'll say it that way. Compensation is paid directly to their order, which is exempt under Section 501c3. Please donate to CSE Ministries. Yeah, so it can go back to the Jesuit order. Members of a, of a religious order providing services to a Catholic organization will be considered for tax purposes to be an agent of his order, provided the religious order is subject to a vow of poverty. Do you realize what we're reading here, folks? Do you realize why we get so radical about 501c3? Why we say, if you're in, uh, under a 501c3 building, you are not in a real church. You are in a false church. I don't care how saved the guy seems to be and whatever else. I don't care. Or it's terrible. false. It is completely false. It's an abomination in the sight of God. I'm showing it to you. The government churches, not just government, they're Jesuitical. It's, it's disgusting. And that Ken Hoven would be part of something like this. And let me just read to you one more certain key aspect of this documentation packet from their tax records. Okay? Schedule O, Supplemental Information in Form 990 or 990 Tech EZ. Explanation, uh, return reference number one. I quote, the College of the Holy Cross is, by tradition and choice, a Jesuit liberal arts college serving the Catholic community, American society, and the wider world. To participate in the life of Holy Cross is to accept an invitation to join in dialogue, i.e. Roman Catholic Church and Jesuit conversion yep. through mind control about basic human questions. Mm -hmm. When they say dialogue, what they're saying is we're going to mind control you into coming back under our system and to rejecting the absolute truth of the Word of God found in the King James Bible. That's what dialogue means. Catholics have no, idea, they have no desire to change or to submit to Bible-believing standards. No desire at all. So anybody that says, I'm working in the ecumenical sphere, they are completely, 100% under the control of the Vatican. And Ken Hoven said this in his court affidavit in 2005, and he said, it isn't that, you know, well, I just started doing this ecumenical. He founded his ministry as an ecumenical ministry. So you need to get a hold of that, all right? In 2015, I believe it is, when he did the interview with 
Rudy Davis, he said, yeah, I, I, I vow of poverty. Yeah, I still have that and everything. He hasn't recanted of it. So, uh, what else do we have here? An article from Forbes.com. This is just basically the same word as this, so it's, I'm not going to include this resource. Okay. Um, Forbes.com. An article from September 15th of 2016 at 2.35 p.m. Titled, Minister's Vow of Poverty. Check that out. Minister's Vow of Poverty does not beat income tax and Kent Hovind update. This is written by Peter J. Riley, who on a previous video that the Lord helped us do in February of this year, exposing uh, Ernie Land and Hovind's connections, mm -hmm. uh, Peter J. Riley openly admitted to being a Jesuit. So Yeah, he's a Jesuit. A Jesuit writing about Kent Hovind. At first I thought, why? But now I realize they're both brothers in the same Jesuit order. So, hey, you know. Why not? I'm not surprised. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, this is rather interesting. This legal precedence described in this article. I'm just going to read this to you quickly because this is very similar to Hoven's case. The tax court sustained an IRS assessment of over one hundred thousand dollars in income and self-employment tax in the case of Ronald W. White, pastor of World Evangelism Outreach Church in. De Funiac Springs, Florida, which is roughly 60, 70 miles east as Pensacola, Florida, if you look it up on a map. Uh, Corporation Soul works well for churches with hierarchical, hierarchical polities. It allows the, ti the title to property to be vested in an office holder. And so, for example, the title to a Catholic parish will usually be in the name of the Roman Catholic Archbishop of, say, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. A corporation soul. It does not work for one man ministries, since there is an identity between the officer holder and the in individual. In 2001, Reverend White ar arranged with WWEOC to reorganize to have an office vested in the office of presiding head apostle, held by Wayne White and his successors, a corporation soul, which was organized in Nevada. In Nevada, and uh, he followed that up with a vow of poverty. It says it in the article. Um, he controlled, and here's where the problem lies with this guy. He controlled the checkbook of the corporation's soul. So he didn't truly take and walk the talk of his vow of poverty. He controlled the checkbook, which is a major no-no. White's vow of poverty insulated him from being taxed on payments made for his benefit by WEOC. So he thought, but the court said otherwise. And, uh, people weighed in and, uh, the Internal Re Revenue Service's original official public pronouncement regarding the vow of poverty, OD 119, which was published in 1919. See OD 119, 1919, 1 CV 82. In part, it stated a clergyman is not liable for any income tax on the amount received by him during the year from the parish of which he is in charge, provided that he turns over to the religious order of which he is a member all the money received in excess of his actual living expenses on account of the vow of poverty which he has taken walk the talk essentially and then revised ruling 77290 cb 26 supersedes what we just saw and it states that income earned by a member of a religious order on account of Services performed directly for the order or for the church with which the order is affiliated and remitted back to the order in conformity with the member's vow of poverty is not includable in the member's gross income. And so, uh, as other cases before this, uh, coadjutor White from the, the panhandle of Florida, he did not remit income to WEOC pursuant to his vow of poverty. He did not completely obey his vow of poverty. Petitioner had signatory authority over the WEOC Apostolic Bank account, which is a major no-no if you are truly taking the vow of poverty, and the payments WEOC made on his behalf served only to benefit Petitioner in meeting his living expenses. The compensationer he received from WEOC and the form of payments WEOC or its related entities made on his behalf must be included in his gross income. So 
the courts threw the books at this white guy because he willfully disobeyed tax code and his religious institutions regulations saying if you're going to take a vow of poverty you must forego all rights to the money and how it's used yep. and uh funny because um people from a professor from three 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 people wrote confirming the same thing of various sources and uh ironically similar thing happened with hovind yeah so again Hoven coming out and, and, and the thing is, it's not even that Hoven's like, yeah, I was wrong for what I did or whatever. He pridefully is like, it was wrong. I was framed. They, they turned against me and everything else. The evolution crowd came against me and stuff. It was a conspiracy and all this stuff. Total stinking hypocrite. Mm -hmm. So I think, is that it for now that we have? Well, this is much? just a confirmation of a continuation of the article showing that uh, Hoven did the pretty much the same thing that this white guy, you know, from the same region of Florida. Man named did. White. Yeah. White guy. You know, that sounds well, funny. Well, Reverend White, you know. Yeah, whatever. As they call him. And, uh, but uh, we aren't going to read that one. Right. We can put a link to it or whatever else. But, you know, um, that I don't think we're going to get into that either right now. Okay. Um, this is just to, just to kind of uh, explain some of this. Longview Baptist Temple is... Uh, what Hoven, what he taught there? According to his affidavit, uh, page. Okay, page four, the top paragraph, he says, uh, our pastor then moved to Longview, Texas and invited me to join him ministering to this much larger church and school there. Longview Baptist Temple. So in 1981, we moved to Longview, Texas, where I took a position teaching science and math at the Longview Christian Academy, uh, ministry of this place, and teaching creation science at Texas Baptist College. Okay. So Affiliated with he, this. Was, he was there, there with this Longview Baptist Temple. This Longview Baptist Temple was very heavily into and inviting constantly Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles, another man that I believe was a Jesuit. You know, another man that was very, very evil, very, very wicked. So, you know, I mean, there's so many different ways that this whole thing can go. But, you know, we're at, what, over a little over an hour here into this thing. I mean, we're just trying to give you the, the full picture here of what's going on. What is a vow of poverty? According to Roman Catholic, you know, doctrine and things like this, it's clearly something that Jesuits take. They take a vow of poverty, and they don't have to be open... open Jesuit priest with the black bale priest thing on the little white thing there. They don't have to be like that. Um, if you go through the Jesuit system, even a retreatant, for crying out loud, they call you a Jesuit, okay, according to, to two different Jesuit priests, all right? So don't give me this nonsense. Oh, well, I, you know, I had, remember this guy, and he was like, you know, my brother-in-law, you know, he, he went th through Loyola University, and he came out, and he's a Baptist pastor now, but he's not a Jesuit. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. If you're going through the mind control that these people, these Jesuits put you through, their, their ways of, of, of distorting history, distorting the facts, distorting the truth, and you can come out and say, well, I'm a Bible-believing Christian now. You are a liar of the worst kind. And for Kent Hovind to openly admit to taking a vow of poverty, that his ministry purpose is ecumenical and He's doing his, this ministry thing for the greater glory of God. Um, we're not dealing with a saved man. Okay. We are dealing with a Jesuit uh, or, or some other religious order. Maybe he's a different religious order, but he looks like a Jesuit. Okay. He acts Talks like a like Jesuit. One. He's the right age. Everything. Okay. I believe the man's a Jesuit. At the very, very, very least, he's a Catholic. Okay. Ecumenical, brethren. That's the mission of the Jesuit order. The Counter Reformation. So, we need to expose this guy. All right. I mean, I, again, I get people. Why don't you just preach the word? Why don't you just preach the word? I would love to, if these stinking Jesuits weren't trying to infiltrate us all the time, if they aren't trying to usurp, you know, what we're doing. I saw a, a quote not long ago. Some somebody had this up, and they said that uh, I think it was Stalin or Lenin, one of the two, and they said the best way to defeat your enemy is to become your enemy. You get in there and you usurp the whole movement. 
by gaining that's, rapport and building rapport with your sure. enemy. Sure, but but let me let me finish what I'm saying. That is the reason why I'm so I'm always on Anderson's case, Stephen Anderson's case, because I know the danger of this guy. I know the danger of Jack Hiles. I know the danger of Ken Hovind. If we don't speak against these people, they're going to come in and they're going to be the King James only movement. They're calling themselves King James Bible believers. They're not King James Bible believers. These people are, are just wicked, completely wicked. And what they want to do is they want to take over what we are as Bible believing Christians and then make us look like monsters. So then people hate us. That's what they want. It's disgusting. These people are ministers of Satan. In order to to damn many, many people to hell. Yeah. As many yeah. as possible. Yeah. And Anderson's going out on his soul winning crusades and stuff like this. They're soul damning crusades. Okay, just like Jack Hiles did. Jack Hiles did the same thing. You go around and you say, uh, everybody, you know, stand up. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Okay, pray this prayer. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And they, they rattle them through this prayer and people are going, but, but, don't ask questions. Pray the prayer. And they pray the prayer and they, and they go, okay, save, 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 save. How many hands prayed the prayer for the first time? Uh, man, 400 a day. Good. 400, 400 souls saved. Revival meeting, 400 souls come to the Lord. They didn't come to anything. And you see people's testimonies years later and they're going, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I'm just like, but I have questions. Don't ask questions. See? And I can tell you, I used to go door to door, right? For Liberty Baptist Church, which was a spinoff of Hiles, right? Jack Hiles actually preached at Liberty Baptist Church. I've talked about that in the past. And we would go door to door and we were meeting. Fortunately, thankfully, by that time, the Hiles cult had pretty much, the thing had split and split and split and split and split. And there was like 30 people going to a church that could seat like 900. It's kind of funny, but you know, we're going out there. Fortunately, by that time, the people that were there were like, yeah, no, it's repentance to salvation. But we were going out and there were still people that were destroyed by that church originally. And they would say, yeah, I used to go to Liberty Baptist before I, you know, I remember this one guy, he's standing there, he's smoking a big cigar and he's like, yeah, he's like, I used to go to Liberty Baptist back before it blew up. Well, are you saved? Whatever, I don't know. They said I was saved. I guess I'm saved. I have no idea. You see? I'm going to be doing a video at some point in time in the future. Lord gave me the idea on this one. I'm going to try to put something together at some point in time. It's on my to-do list. About church buildings were created to form atheists. To make people into atheists. It's all over the internet. All over the place. I was raised in church. I was raised as a Christian. I used to be an evangelical Christian. Now I'm an atheist. You know why? Because you go into the church building, you go into that structure, and you're like, I don't even like being here. There's so many things that make me feel really, really weird. There's so many things I'm being forced to do, and I don't want to do this. And is this stuff in Scripture? Shut up, don't ask questions. But I just, shut up, don't ask questions. And you're forced to believe these things, and, you're, and there's no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no time for it. You're not allowed to have a personal relationship with the Lord exactly. Jesus Christ. Exactly, exactly. You're you know? not allowed to read it's, His Word on your own. Yeah. And what happens is, and if you do, and you start to ask questions, oh, you're a troublemaker. And then they we're throw you into to, a mental hygiene. Appointment. Well, if they have enough power for that. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's insanity. It's insanity. And Ken Hovind is a part of this whole system. Ken Hovind is a Jesuit. I believe it firmly. I believe that the guy's a Jesuit. Me too. You know, Stephen Anderson, is he a Jesuit? I have no idea, but I can prove the fact that he is a temporal coadjutor. Somebody that is helping out in the the, he's not an open priest, and, but he's a coadjutor, meaning he helps. All right? He's a helping the Roman Catholic system come in. Their film that they're coming out with, that they want to try to come out with, this Babylon USA thing. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to fight as hard as I can against this satanic film coming out. They've already come out with a propaganda film that hates the Jews. They quote part of Martin Luther's book that talks about burning the Jewish synagogues down. And then they say, we're not calling for violence. <laughs> That's the other thing. We have to understand this. Christians, we have a, we have a real weakness as Christians. And that, that weakness is we don't want to believe that people are lying to us. Because we're so anxious to see people getting saved. And we're so anxious to just like, my life has changed. I'm so, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And we're just like, I want to share it with everybody. And what happens is these liars come along and they say to us, 
I'm a Christian. And we go, really? Well, praise the Lord, that's wonderful. And we get so excited. And yet we don't realize they're lying to us. They're lying right to our faces. I was once saying that Ken Hoven changed my life. Never understanding his connections. Never understanding it. And it's been a real struggle for me to believe the truth about Ken Hoven. And to realize that this guy was stabbing us in the back the whole time as Bible-believing Christians. And the worst is yet to come with him. I believe that. I really do believe. Unless we can get out and show the truth. This guy's a Jesuit. And, you know, I'm going to close this video with, a, with a, just another little bit of a, a word to the Jesuit order. Because I know you're watching. I know you people watch us. I understand that. Let me just say this. Your little game that you're playing, your eyes are blinded by Lucifer, your God. You think to yourself that you have so much power, that you have so many things in control. And, you know, you do control a lot, at least in your minds. You see, the fact of the matter is Lucifer, Lucifer your God, is subservient to our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus to you is just part of your control structure. It's part of the mind control that you put people under. You don't believe in Jesus. I know that. That's why people like Stephen Anderson, they hate Jesus. They say, oh, he burned in hell. He had to burn in hell and all this other stuff. And they say he's not a Jew and all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand your true hatred. But let me just explain something to you. Your system will never give you safety. It will never give you peace. And if you step out of line, you know that you're expendable. You know it. Why would you be in a system like that? You say, well, I'm afraid to come out of it. I'd like to come out of it and things like this. God can protect you. I came out of it with the Lord Jesus Christ's help. Yeah. Yeah. She came out. I was born into it and she's the Lord doing, got me out of it. She's doing just fine. Yeah. You can come out of it. But uh, if you want to play the game right up until the end, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. And let me just say this, too. This thing's been out for a while, since 2005. And the Lord literally just revealed this thing to us not long ago. And I did a search on YouTube. No one's brought this out. It's right there, part of the public record, his affidavit. Why hasn't anybody brought this thing out? Because the Lord hides things. The Lord allows things to be hidden. Why? Because he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But here's the other thing. The Bible says, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. The longer this thing goes, the more the Lord's going to be showing to people like us and others out there. The more the Lord is ripping back the veil of your secret little world. And I'm going to tell you right now, when the Lord shows us information, we're going to bring it out. I don't care how personal it is. I don't care who gets hurt. We're going to bring it out. And I pray that God stops you. I pray that the wrath of God comes upon every single one of you Jesuits out there and coadjutors and all the other people under the umbrella of Jesuitry that are trying to bring Christians back under the authority of your Roman Catholic system. I'm going to tell you right now, as God is my witness, we are going to expose you. As long as the Lord keeps us safe, if the Lord ever gives us over to you people, I'm sure we're going to be dead in no time at all. That's fine, because the two of us are not going to rest as long as we are here. You better hope for the rapture, all right? You better hope for it, because otherwise, the Lord's going to keep giving us stuff, and we're going to expose you, and we're going to stop your stupid little plans. And it is stupid, too, by the way. So that's going to be it. We have more things that we're going to be coming out with in the future, more things that the Lord has revealed to us, because you see another problem with the Jesuit order is their pride. Pride both before destruction. Go ahead. And a haughty spirit. Excuse me. And in haughty spirit before a fall. That wasn't actually the scripture I was going to use. I was going to say about Satan, Leviathan. He is the uh, father of all the children of pride. I think it says, messing my scripture reference and up the father there. Father of lies. You know, father of lies. Yes, but he's he's the king king of the children of pride. All right. So the pride of the Jesuit order blinds them and they actually will come out pridefully and say things 
and admit things thinking nobody's going to find this. Uh, well, as God gives us the information, we're going to bring it out. And we're going to expose you. Okay? So that's going to be that. Um, it is a foolish, foolish thing to serve Satan. So foolish. It is not worth it. I mean, you look at these guys in the in the uh, tax return thing there, and they're you know these Jesuits, and they're like, "Oh, I'm retiring with you know two, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars." Jesus Christ said, "What shall a man give in exchange for his soul?" You better think about that. 